Hello and welcome. I'm Al Barrows, and this is UFO Disclosure, the podcast that's meant to show an average person's reaction to all the UAP, UFO news from everywhere and anywhere. So we recently had a historic, uh, never-before, congressional UAP hearing, and we're expecting further transparency on the UFO issue from the government in the near future. And this has never happened before. Ever since Roswell, the government has had a staunch uh, position and constant uh, policy of denial. Um, but there has been some sort of a paradigm shift. And now all of a sudden, it's become mainstream and acceptable for even politicians to talk about the UFO phenomenon. I'd like to take a look at how we got here and how, in my opinion, Area 51 played a major role in getting us here. And I know that I've covered Area 51 before in my podcast, but I've never really delved into how the investigative reporter George Knapp and um, Bob Lazar were instrumental in revealing Area 51. I feel that it's important to highlight that. I'd like to start by showing you some old clips of me um, at the front and back gates of Area 51. Uh, then the narrative will switch into clips of Bob Lazar and George Knapp. And this is all coming from George Knapp's new show, um, News Nation. So many thanks and uh, shout out to George Knapp and thanks very much to both George Knapp and Bob Lazar. Um, towards the end, I also uh, present a new Area 51 whistleblower and Adam Adair. And I got this uh, from a post on X, and the post uh, was from Vicky Verma, so I have to thank Vicky Verma for his post. This new whistleblower um, has been silent for several decades and finally decided to come out. And it's a very interesting testimony. He sp speaks about an engine that uh, he was asked to look at at Area 51. Finally, um, I'd like to end with a transition into a timeline and uh, how there was an, uh, finally a storming of Area 51 and maybe how we got to the present uh, UAP hearing situation. Hi, this is Al Barrows with UFO Disclosure on site at Area 51. This is supposedly the front gate. Uh, Area 51, according to authorities, does not exist. Hey, this is Al Barrows from UFO Disclosure. I'm on site at the main entrance of Area 51. They say that this is the main entrance, but it's actually 40 miles from the main base. The exit entrance that I was at earlier, which is south of here, is really the main entrance and that's much closer this is 40 miles as i said from the base and if you look around you can see that there are cameras probably being watched as we speak if you turn around you look at the road it's a very secluded uh, one lane road where it's very difficult to get here so i'm at groom lake just outside of Area 51. And you can see how vast this place is. Just a huge uh, dried lake bed. And it's great for uh, racing. This is where they tested a lot of vehicles back in the day and they still test uh, futuristic vehicles. Try and get a picture of what the ground looks like. It's all dried up, it's hard as a rock. But it's still an active lake bed. It's huge. You can see where they could use this to test vehicles. Just a big open space.
conflicts are about as close as anyone will ever come to seeing what the place looks like again. The dry bed of Groom Lake, corrugated metal buildings, a three-mile-long runway, and some highly sophisticated radar and detection equipment. It's been known by many names over the years, Dreamland, The Ranch, The Skunk Works. If ever there was a place to test a secret new technology, this is it. And that's exactly what's been done here for decades. Area 51 is where Francis Gary Powers... Uh, actually nine uh, flying saucers, flying discs, uh, that are out there of extraterrestrial origin. And uh, they're basically being dismantled. Uh, some are, well, in various stages of, of completion, built from other parts, and they're being test flown and uh, uh, basically just analyzed. You say there's nine saucers. How, how are those tests going? Uh, as far as what? As far as whether they're successful and, and, and that sort of thing. Oh, well, some of them are 100% intact and operate perfectly. Uh, the other ones are being taken apart. Uh, I was involved mainly in, in propulsion and the power source. Basically, uh, as far as I can remember, about half of them do operate. And the other half are, are just been torn down, uh, basically to analyze the components to them. Where, where did we get these saucers? Uh, how did they come into the hands of the government? I haven't the slightest idea. And uh, you have to understand the information is very compartmentalized and uh, I was only allowed information that pertained particularly to what I was involved in. But I mean, couldn't, couldn't our government have made them as opposed to getting them from some alien beings? Totally impossible. The propulsion system is an, uh, a gravity propulsion system. The power source is an antimatter reactor. We're talking to the guy who turned out to be Bob Lazar. He told us his life story, where he'd gone to school, where he'd worked before, and some of what he had seen out there. He says he was hired to work at an area called S4, which is a few miles south of Groom Lake. At S4, he says, are flying saucers, antimatter reactors, and other working examples of technology that is seemingly beyond human capabilities. Right, this, this came from somewhere else. I mean, as bizarre as that is to believe, but I mean, it's there, I saw it. I know what the current state of the art is in, in, in physics, and it's, it can't be done. So what I'm, what I'm asking is, why, why are you starting to go public with this information? Um, there's a shift, a change in, in perception of the public and the attitude. Uh, if it hadn't been for that, I, I would have went to my grave and never said a word about this because I wanted a normal, you know, mainstream life career. Um, like I'm going to tell people, uh, yeah, I'll stand on top of an alien engine in the basement of a top secret base called Area 51, uh, mainly because I built an engine similar to it and it landed there and that's why they wanted me there. And I was 17 years old at the time. Um, never, despite, uh, despite the fact that I won the most outstanding field of engineering sciences from the United States Air Force in 1971 and we can see newspaper stories and clippings of me and that rocket. So. Um, I wouldn't, still wouldn't stand a chance. So I decided, no, I'm not saying a word. I saw a lot of people take tremendous criticism in the 60s and the 70s, but then there's been a shift in the last 20 years. Uh, the American public now really believes there's somebody else out there. And if somebody would land here right now, the American public would go, cool, as long as they're not trying to blow us away or eat us up or something, there's no problem. Um, what they will be a problem is, is that if the federal government's caught lying, which they know they are lying, they've been lying for f probably since 1971 that I know for sure. So if they've been lying, then Roswell is very likely it's true. So they've been lying 50 consecutive years and probably much longer than that. The engine I saw did not come from the Roswell crash. The engine I saw was as big as the Roswell craft. Okay, so that was Adam Adair, an Area 51 whistleblower that uh, came out recently. Um, I guess he thought he was safe after so many years and the uh, mindset and the atmosphere is safe enough that he could uh, reveal what he knows about Area 51. Um, the Bob Lazar uh, NAP uh, footage was from 1989. And after that, after 1989 and 1995, uh, George Knapp meets the Senator Harry Reid. And in 1997, Lieutenant Corso writes The Day After Roswell. And in that book, um, he reveals how a lot of the wreckage from the Roswell crash has been used uh, in today's tech. It was back engineered. Uh, 
In 2001, you had Dr. Greer's first press club event. And in 2007, Senator Harry Reid and Robert Bigelow formed the ATIC program, which at the time was classified. Lou Alizondo is in charge of ATIP for about seven years um, with funding from Senator Harry Reid um, from Nevada. And while Elizondo was there uh, on 2013, on August the 16th, the CIA finally acknowledges that Area 51 exists. And by 2017, Elizondo resigns from ATIP. He's disgruntled and unhappy that his findings aren't being taken seriously by the Pentagon. Tom DeLong, that same year, forms To the Stars Academy, and Elizondo decides to work with To the Stars Academy. But he also brings with him three um, tapes from his time at ATIP. The ATIP, uh, the Tic Tac, the Gimbal, and the Go Fast videos. Elizondo and uh, Chris Mellon, who was the Assistant uh, Deputy Secretary of Defense, Chris Mellon, they both meet Leslie Kane. And Leslie Kane then, uh, with Ralph Blumenthal, wrote that uh, uh, historic 2017 New York Times article where they revealed um, that uh, the Navy had footage of uh, the Tic Tac 2018, after decades of avoiding the media, Lazar comes out of hiding, ends his silence, and has an interview with Jeremy Corbell. And uh, he speaks about how the most astonishing thing that uh, he saw revealed at Area 51 um, was the alien reactor motor. By 2019, people have had enough, and there is a storming of Area 51 college student by the name of Maddie Roberts posts on social media an invite to storm Area 51. A half a million people sign up and roughly about 3,000 wind up showing up and they hang out for about three days. Yeah, there were about uh, 3,000 people that uh, showed up um, over a number of days, um, turned out to be quite a uh, peaceful event. The military was on hand. Okay, so that goes to show you the power of social media when one single college student, Maddie Roberts, was able to rile up half a million people and about 3,000 showed up at Area 51. And I think this is where more or less the paradigm shift occurred. After a decade of uh, the UFO subject being taboo, uh, after that, it became mainstream and accepted, and Congress really started to take a, a serious look at it and ask questions. By 2020, there was a UAP task force that was formed. Task force is formed. By 2021, Congress wants a report. The report actually comes out with 143 cases out of 144 UFO incidents that are unexplained. Unexplainable, folks. 143 out of 144. And this past year, um, Dr. Greer had his second uh, press club event, which went uh, very well. And I'm sure that he was very instrumental in what's going on now with the UAP hearings. Uh, then this past July, Grush, Grush's efforts, and as well as uh, Dr. Greer's, initiated the first congressional UAP hearings. And uh, these were the three uh, individuals, three whistleblowers that were featured um, in the 2023 July uh, first historic UAP hearings. David Grush on the left, Ryan Graves in the middle, and David Fravor on the right.
want to thank uh, Dr. Greer for all his efforts and ongoing efforts on uh, exposing uh, what's going on with the secrecy on the UFO phenomenon. Um, I want to thank several people as well um, that I borrowed from in order to put this together. Uh, first of all, um, George Knapp, of course, and his News Nation footage, Bob Lazar for all his efforts and bravery, Adam Adair, of course, for his bravery in coming out, uh, Dr. Greer, of all people, yes, I mentioned that, and thanks to Vicky Verma as well for your posts on the Adam uh, Adair um, footage. All the um, good intentions and love uh, go out to all. Keep looking up at the sky and uh, let's keep uh, pushing for more hearings. Thank you. Thank you for uh, listening. <laughs>